So now the second part about uh, two-dimensional NMR, and in this way we'll concentrate almost exclusively um, on heteronuclear correlation spectra. These are 2D spectra. We have two different kinds of nuclei involved. Um, and what we're going to see typically um, in these spectra is we will see cross peaks which will indicate uh, coherence transfer through a heteronuclear coupling. That's in contrast to COSY, where the cross peaks arose due to transfer through a homonuclear coupling between, for example, two protons. And typically, these correlation spectra will have involved carbon-13 and proton, so you end up in one dimension with the carbon-13 uh, chemical shifts, and in uh, the other dimension uh, with the proton chemical shifts. So this shows you the correlation of chemical shifts of uh, different kinds of nuclei. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is extremely uh, useful if you're working on the assignment of either of these spectra. It also has the nice feature that if one of the nuclei has a much larger chemical shift range than the other nucleus, then your peaks in the two-dimensional spectrum can be well dispersed. So this can give you an increase in resolution. And these experiments work most straightforwardly if you transfer through one bond couplings because they tend to be large and rather constant from one molecule to another. But as I'll show you, you can also do them through transfer through long range couplings. So these are quite flexible experiments. And I think after COSY, they're certainly the most widely used. Now, you've immediately got a problem when you start thinking about these experiments, and that is about which way you're going to do them. Because, for example, if we're correlating carbon-13 and proton, we can choose either to observe the carbon-13, or we can observe the proton. Now, it turns out that there's a sensitivity advantage to be gained from observing proton, because it's the higher gamma nucleus. So in all other things being equal, uh, it would be the sensible nucleus to choose rather than carbon-13. But the problem is, if you're dealing with natural abundance samples, almost all of the protons in the sample are not coupled to a carbon-13. In fact, 99% of them, to be precise. So that your spectrum can become swamped by the very strong signal from protons which are not attached to carbon-13. And because of this, historically, these correlation spectra were always done by observing carbon-13, simply because it made them technologically easier to do. And these were regarded as the normal way of doing it. Now, as the technology has moved on, it's now actually perfectly straightforward to observe proton in these experiments. Um, but because it was the opposite way that it was done originally, Correlation experiments where you observe proton were originally known as inverse experiments because they were the other way up. However, they've now become the norm. So the normal experiment is an inverse experiment. I hope that's absolutely clear. Right? And that's just a <laughs> terminology. It's just a bit of history. So uh, the experiments I'm going to show you are inverse experiments in the sense that we observe the high gamma nucleus, the proton. So the first of these correlation experiments uh, is called HSQC, uh, and there's the pulse sequence. And, you know, again, if you just look at this pulse sequence, it thinks, oh, all these pulses and stuff. But you should now be able to recognize and break down these pulse sequences into their individual elements. Because we see immediately that happens is that there's an I spin pulse, I is proton, for example, generates magnetization, and period A is just a spin echo. So what's going to happen during that spin echo is that the uh, offset will be free refocused, but the coupling uh, will not be refocused. So during the first spin echo A, we're going to generate antiphase magnetization on the I spin. Period B is a couple of pulses. Well, you know, now, you know now, particularly from the discussion of inept that we had in the couple of lectures ago, that this will cause coherence transfer of the antiphase states to the S-spin. And once they're on the S-spin, these are going to evolve 
for time t1. Uh, so period C is just evolution of the S spins. Notice there's a 180 degree pulse in the middle of that. What does that do? Well, you know what that's going to do. It's going to refocus the coupling because it's only acting on spin I, but it will not refocus the offset of spin S because it's not applied to spin S. So actually period C is another type of spin echo. It's one where the coupling is refocused, but the offset is not. And then finally, we have a couple of pulses again, and they transfer the antiphase terms back to the I spin, and therefore we can observe the signal on the I spin. So what this is, is an inept type transfer. The first little part is actually the inept sequence to the S spin. We allow it to evolve for T1 on the S spin, and then we transfer it back again. So you could describe this as a double inept transfer. So now what we'll do is we'll do an analysis of this sequence. We will do it in a clever way. In other words, we're not going to grind through every pulse. We're going to say, OK, that's a spin echo. I can ignore that. I don't need to worry about that. Uh, to focus in on the essential things that are going on. So first of all, uh, you've done this endlessly now. Uh, the first spin echo at the end of period A, you've got an in-phase term IY, and you've got an anti-phase term 2IXSZ. And I've switched to the IS notation because we're using uh, uh, heteronuclei. Now this term in IY, this will never be transferred to the S spin because it's not antiphase. So I'm going to forget about this term straight away because if I carry it forward in the calculation, it will just waste ink and not go anywhere. So just concentrating on the antiphase term, the antiphase term 2IXSZ is transferred by those two pulses in period B uh, to the S spin. And it comes out as 2IZSY, so it's now transferred to the S spin. And notice that that pulse has to be a Y pulse on the I spin, otherwise you wouldn't get any transfer. It's exactly the same as in the inept sequence. And then we have evolution for period C, which is T1. And remember that we know that the coupling will be refocused, so I don't need to worry about that. And the only thing that's acting is the S spin offset. So that term 2IZSY splits apart into two terms, a 2IZSY with a cosine modulation and a 2IZSX with a sine modulation. And then we need to just to include the effect of the pi pulse just to complete the calculation. And then finally, we just do the transfer back to the I spin. And in fact, it's only the 2IZSY term which gets transferred back to the I spin. That becomes 2IYSZ. The other term, the 2IZSX, that just disappears into multiple quantum and is not observable. So in fact, the only observable term at the end of period D is this antiphase term 2IYSZ. And you'll see in this analysis how we've done several things. We've taken advantage of all the things that we know about spin echoes to simplify calculations. And we've casually tossed away terms as we go along because uh, we know that they're not going to do anything. Now, to be more precise, I know that they're not going to do anything, but with experience, you will also know that they're not going to do anything. So this is our observable term. So what does the spectrum look like? Um, it's this, and we can see here that it's going to be antiphase on spin I, because it's 2IYSZ. So it's going to be antiphase on spin I in the little omega 2 dimension. And if you look at the modulation in T1, the modulation is cos omega s T1. So that means there's just a single frequency modulating the spectrum in T1. Don't confuse this sine 2 pi j tau 1 term. That's not a modulation term. It's not a function of T1. 
all that term does is affect the intensity of the peak. So, what we've got is shown in the cartoon at the bottom. We've got an antiphase doublet centered on the offset of the I spin in the little omega 2 dimension, and we've got a single peak centered on the, uh, at the offset of uh, omega s in the little omega 1 dimension. Um, so, that is the end of it, really. That's the spectrum. And you can see from that spectrum, you could read off the shift of the I and the shift of the S spin. So it correlates the two spins. And of course, there will be no peak there if there isn't a coupling, because the intensity of the peak goes as this sine 2 pi j tau 1 term. And if j is 0, there's no peak. So you see a peak here, a correlation, if there's a j coupling between I and S. <laughs> And you can spot, of course, that to get the maximum intensity, you need to set tau 1 to 1 over 4j. Don't you always? So that's the simplest form of the HSQC spectrum. There's actually, it's normally used in a more elaborated form, which is shown here as pulse sequence B. And the difference of pulse sequence B is it has an extra spin echo at the end, and then it uses decoupled acquisition. Here, we're acquiring on spin i, and this blue rectangle is the decoupling on the s spins. And you'll remember from what we talked about before when we were talking about inept, that you can't use decoupling on an antiphase state because it will collapse to zero. So what's happening during period E is that the antiphase term which uh, appeared after the transfer pulses D is going to in phase and then once it goes to in phase you can observe it with decoupling so if you do the analysis there it is there's the antiphase term 2IYS said goes to an in phase term IX and that's the term that you can ultimately observe so if you use a decoupled acquisition which you do in sequence B, then you'll only observe the in-phase term, and it will have intensity that depends on tau 1 and tau 2. And you can spot, of course, that the optimum uh, values for tau 1 and tau 2 are uh, both 1 over 4j. So if you think about what the spectra look like, uh, on A, as shown at the top, you see an antiphase doublet in the little omega 2 dimension, whereas if you use decoupling, as in B, you just see a single peak in the omega 2 dimension. And you can see how nice this spectrum is. You see a single peak, the offset of one spin that way, the offset of the other spin that way. What could be simpler? Uh, very easy to interpret. And you can see that's why these spectra have become so popular. Now, there's just one thing we need to worry about, and remember that is because uh, we're doing this in the inverse mode. So the I spins typically are proton, and the S spins are typically carbon 13. And of course, the majority of the I spins, the majority of the protons, are not coupled to any carbon 13s at all. So all those pulses to the S spin don't make any difference to those protons and those protons will just come blasting through that first part of the sequence and give you a very strong signal in the spectrum and that signal will contain no useful information because those protons are not coupled to carbon 13 so we really got to suppress the signal from the protons the I spins that are not coupled to the carbon 13 that are not coupled to the S spins and the way you do this is you seek to find something in the pulse sequence which affects the I spins which are coupled to S in a different way to the I spins that are not coupled to S. So for example, think about the first S spin 90 degree pulse. Those I spins that are not coupled to S, they have no way of experiencing that pulse. It doesn't do anything to them. And that's the key to getting rid of the unwanted signal. 
So we do the experiment twice. We do it once where the S spin pulse is phase X. And then we do it again where the S spin pulse is phase minus X. And if you work through the calculation, you will discover that, of course, only the transferred signal is affected, in other words, the one that we analysed, and of course all that happens to it is it will just change sign. So if you just take the difference between experiment A and experiment B, the wanted signal will add up and the unwanted signal will magically disappear. And this is an example of a difference experiment we came across this when we were talking about inept. We talked about suppressing an unwanted signal. And it's also an example of a simple phase cycle. So this is what you would do in this experiment to suppress these unwanted signals. When we talk about coherence selection, uh, about a more formal way of describing that. So that's the first of our heteronuclear experiments, the HSQC experiment. Now there's a variant on this experiment uh, which is probably done more often than the uh, HSQC experiment and that's called the HMQC experiment and the pulse sequence for this uh, is shown here. And it looks a bit similar but actually rather fundamentally different when you analyse it about how it works. So let's go through how this works and it's a little bit less intuitive than the HSQC sequence. So you start with a pulse to the I spin and during this period tau antiphase will build up because the IS coupling is acting. And then you have a pulse to the S spin and what this S spin pulse does is it generates multiple quantum, in fact it's heteronuclear multiple quantum because it involves two different kinds of spins. So B generates heteronuclear multiple quantum and then during period C this heteronuclear multiple quantum evolves um, and then what happens is pulse D transfers the multiple quantum back to normal signals, observable antiphase, and then that's finally observed uh, on uh, the I spin with broadband S spin decoupling. And although it looks very different, the spectrum you get is exactly the same as the one that we got from HSQC, but it arises in a rather different way. So what we want to do now is do an analysis of this pulse sequence to show in detail how it works. And you will have already spotted that period A is not a spin echo and period E is not a spin echo. Uh, period C is a spin echo. And if you just started the analysis at the first pulse and just carried forward, you'd find that actually this is surprisingly complicated, this analysis. So we need to be clever. And the clever thing we're going to spot is that there's this period F. And if you look at F, which has got a 180 degree pulse in the middle of it, that actually forms a spin echo on the I spin. And in fact, it refocuses the offset of the I spin over the entire period F, over tau and T1 and tau. So in fact, throughout the analysis of this pulse sequence, one can simply ignore the offset of the I spin. And that will give us a, a major simplification right to begin with. Now, you may object to this because you'll say, well, hang on, what about those pulses to the S spin, B and D? But actually, because they're applied to the S spin, they don't have any effect on the evolution of the I spin. So this spin echo refocusing the whole of the period is unaffected by those pulses B and D. So our analysis actually now becomes rather simple because we're allowed to ignore the offset of the I spin. So let's do the analysis. So the I spin, uh, first pulse forms uh, minus IY 
and then during A, the coupling evolves to give me this antiphase term 2IXSZ. And I've already said I can ignore the offset of the I spin. Now, only this term 2IXSZ will be transferred to multiple quantum. So I'm going to ignore the IY term straight away. So the effect of pulses B uh, is to transfer them to uh, the multiple quantum. The next thing you need to remember is that when the multiple quantum evolves, we've already decided we're going to ignore the effect of the I-spin offset. So the only thing affecting the multiple quantum will be the S-spin offset. You'll remember that the coupling between I and S is, doesn't affect the evolution of the multiple quantum. So we can ignore the coupling. So the, the end of all of that is that the multiple quantum term 2IXSY, which is formed by the pulse B, we only have to worry about its evolution under the S-spin offset. So that gives me a term 2IXSY and a term 2IXSX. So that's got me to the end of period C. And now I have to do uh, the pulse uh, D. And in fact, only the 2IXSY term gets transferred to observable. So that gives me the 2IXSZ term. And then finally, that term evolves under the coupling during period E to give you two terms. And then when we observe uh, during T2, it's only this in-phase term in uh, IY uh, which is observable. The anti-phase term disappears. So the end of all of that is we end up with something that's very similar to what we had for the HSQC. We've got uh, this in-phase term IY, which is modulated at omega s in T1, and the intensity uh, goes as this sine pi j i s uh, tau term. So tau, the optimum value, is of course uh, 1 over 2 j. So we end up with a spectrum that looks exactly the same as the HSQC, a peak at omega s, a peak at omega i, and the optimum value for tau is 1 over 2 j. So a typical spectrum is something like this. This is a carbon-13 in, uh, in this vertical dimension, proton this way, and each one of these peaks um, is uh, a correlation through a one-bond coupling, um, and you can just pick off the carbon-13 and proton shifts. So this is a very straightforward kind of uh, spectroscopy to do. Now, for complicated reasons to do with relaxation, it's normally held that for small molecules, you get a slightly better spectrum with HMQC, and for large molecules, you get a slightly better spectrum with HSQC. So if you look at people who are doing NH correlations in proteins, they always tend to use HSQC. People doing CH correlations on small molecules tend to use HMQC. Although I think in practice the difference between them is very small. Now this correlation spectrum is done by transferring the magnetization through a one bond coupling. So one bond CH couplings are large and they don't vary very much from um, molecule to molecule. So you can easily choose a value of the delay tau, this delay here, uh, that's a good compromise for all of the uh, couplings in the spectrum. Now you might want to do correlations through long-range couplings, uh, particularly, for example, if you're trying to make connectivities or you're trying to find quaternary carbons which don't have protons attached to them. And so if you want to do correlations through long-range couplings, which are typically an order of magnitude smaller than one-bond couplings, all you need to do is make tau longer. Uh, and if you make tau longer, you'll start to get transfers through uh, smaller couplings. Unfortunately, this turns out to be a bit tricky 
because the intensity uh, in this long range spectrum goes as the square of this sine pi j tau term and if I plot that out for some different long range couplings you'll see what the problem is so I've plotted it for an 11 hertz coupling, a 7 hertz coupling and a 3 hertz coupling and that's not an unusual range of long range couplings that you could get uh, in a single molecule and you're going to see that if I chose for example a delay there of about 70 milliseconds I'd get quite good intensity for the 7 hertz coupling I wouldn't get very good intensity for the 3 hertz coupling and in fact I've actually made the delay a bit too long for the 11 hertz coupling so that wouldn't necessarily be a very good choice uh, if I for example choose 90 milliseconds uh, I'd actually get no intensity at all for the 11 hertz couplings because they've gone to a minimum I'd get slightly better intensity for the 7 and a bit more intensity for the 3 and if I said, well, you know, why don't I go out here and choose uh, a nice long value, about 170 milliseconds, so I get very good intensity for the 3 hertz couplings, well, I'm actually getting rather little intensity for the 7 and the 11. So there's really no way of choosing uh, a single value uh, which gives you good intensity for all possible long-range couplings, simply because they have too wide a spread. So you basically have to choose a compromise. You either choose a small value which gives you some intensity for all of them or you decide well I'm going to do several different experiments with different values of the delay. There's another problem we need to worry about and that is that uh, in the experiment I showed you which is pulse sequence A there are two delays tau and the intensity will go as sine squared of pi j tau. Now if you chose to do away with the broadband decoupling you could shorten the pulse sequence to the one uh, shown in B and that only has one value of tau and now the intensity goes as just sine pi j tau. Now why might that be an advantage? Well the reason that might be an advantage is that if you're using a value of tau which is well below the optimum then sine squared is much less than sine. You see if you're right out at the top here where the intensity is almost one they're the same but if you're working right down here where tau is much less than the optimum you might get more intensity using uh, the experiment B rather than experiment A and in fact the experiment which most people call HMBC heteronuclear multiple bond correlation is normally experiment B where you leave out the decoupling and just have one tau delay and in fact there's also another reason for doing that is that you need to remember that during these delays you'll get relaxation and uh, this relaxation will be rather small if the delay is a millisecond or two which you might have for a lot a, a one bond correlation spectrum but if you're correlating through long range couplings this delay could be tens or maybe even a hundred milliseconds and you'll get a lot of relaxation so that's another reason to use the experiment where you only have one tau delay rather than two and it also it helps to realize that the transfer, the intensity will go as sine pi j tau but there will also be a relaxation damping term e to the minus r tau which we haven't really accounted for and the faster that relaxation goes as you'll see from the graph first of all you get less and less signal but it also moves the maximum to uh, a value less than 1 over 2j so even if you were looking for correlations through very small couplings you wouldn't probably choose to use a smaller value of tau than 1 over 2j simply because the relaxation will kill you if you use a 1 over 2j as the delay but nevertheless uh, despite all its difficulties this HMBC spectrum is very popular uh, particularly for carbon proton where you might want to look through these long-range correlations to establish some more connectivity 
So this is an HMBC spectrum, carbon-13 on the vertical axis, proton on the horizontal axis. Um, and it's not, it, there's no decoupling been used during acquisition. Um, and you can see some one bond correlations where you can see the big splitting due to the one bond uh, big J coupling there and all of these other peaks are long range couplings. This has proved to be uh, a popular kind of spectroscopy as well. Now I'm going to finish up uh, going back to homonuclear spectra and just tell you a little bit about another kind of uh, spectrum which is related to COSY uh, which is this TOXI spectrum. Now when I talked about COSY first of all I uh, gave you an example uh, where you had A coupled to B coupled to D and C coupled to E and you can tell that from the COSY spectrum because although there's an AB cross peak and a BD cross peak there's no cross peak between A and D. And there's also no cross peaks between C and E and any of the other spins. So from the cosy, you, we would say that you could pick out that the coupling topology was a linear case ABD and then a disconnected group C and E. Now TOXI is a different kind of spectrum and it gives you a very similar display, except in TOXI, you see correlations between spins which are either coupled or have an unbroken chain of couplings between them. And so the difference you would see in a TOXI spectrum, in this case, would be that you'd see a cross peak between A and D. And you can spot that in the top left-hand corner of the TOXI spectrum. And you see a cross peak between A and D because A is coupled to B and B is coupled to D. So in TOXI, that means you can see an AD cross peak. So TOXI is very good for picking out what you might call extended spin systems. It picks out cross peaks between a network of spins that are all mutually coupled. So it provides slightly different and in often cases usefully complementary information to COSY. Now the TOXI pulse sequence looks like this. It's similar to COSY to start with. You do 90 T1 and then the mixing period consists of a period of a special pulse sequence which creates a, a, a thing called isotropic mixing. An isotropic mixing is a special kind of coherence transfer between coupled spins. So that uh, pale blue period uh, is an isotropic mixing period. And what we usually do is we arrange that before the isotropic mixing starts, we only have Z magnetization. That's at point A. And after the isotropic mixing, we also arrange only to have Z magnetization. And this would have to be done, for example, using phase cycling. Now, the analysis of isotropic mixing is outside what we're able to do with product operators as we have developed them so far. Uh, the theory can be extended to describe this, but it's a, not a trivial extension. So I'll just tell you what happens during isotropic mixing. So if you start on I1Z, during a period of isotropic mixing, some of it retains on I1Z, but some of it gets transferred to I2Z. And that's shown in green there, and you also get some zero quantum formed. And the bit that gets transferred to I2Z is the interesting part, uh, because when you have the final 90 degree pulse, that becomes observable on spin 2, and that's how you generate cross peaks. And the cross peak intensity goes as 1 minus cos 2 pi j tau. And I emphasize you can't get this from the simple product operator treatment. So the details are a bit beyond us at the moment, but what you find is that the cross and diagonal peaks are both in phase and they all have the same line shape. 
And this is a strong contrast to cosy. In cosy, the cross peaks were in antiphase in each dimension. In Toxi, the cross peaks are all in phase and they all have the same line shape. The intensity of the cross peak goes as this 1 minus cos 2 pi j tau function and lo and behold it's a maximum when the delay is 1 over 2 j as ever. Um, the difficulty is that given you don't know what j is you can't choose what tau needs to be. So again, you have to choose a compromise value of tau that will give you reasonable intensity for all the cross peaks you're interested in. So it's not without its difficulties. But it gives you very nice spectra. This is a toxy spectrum uh, on the uh, a part of a toxy spectrum of the same molecule I've been using for all of the others. You see it has very nice phase properties. Everything is in phase. Everything is in absorption mode line shape. Uh, and you get lots of cross peaks and you get lots of cross peaks because they can be uh, cross peaks that show couplings and also unbroken chains of couplings so interpreting this spectrum is more ambiguous than cosy but if you've got a cosy on one hand and a toxy on the other it's very good for sorting out more complex uh, assignment problems uh, so that's the last one we're going to talk about and that brings us to the end for the discussion for 2D.